Norris and everybody who's been helping with the technical and uh, all the other logistic issues and uh, thank you for bringing us here and, and uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you and, and uh, hear your questions and talk to you and all. So thank you very much. Um, what I want to talk about now um, is built on uh, the relational models idea, but it shows you one direction that uh, this theory can take you to help you understand uh, other things that have been studied from other perspectives in the past, and uh, this, give, this relational models theory uh, provides a different perspective. Now, I'm not, uh, normally when I give a talk, I try to, you know, start at the beginning and get to the end, but this talk is going to kind of go a little bit here, and then it's going to go out there and come back here, and then it's going to go a little over here and come back here and a little over here, and then finally we'll kind of go on toward there. And there are reasons for that. Um, I, I apologize for the kind of complex structure, but um, there's some things I want to do, and uh, I think it's, they're best done that way. So, violence. Now, I have to say that um, I'm going to show some somewhat graphic pictures of violence, and I, I do so diffidently, but I, I don't, it isn't for the pornography of it, it isn't for the shock value, or the, it's to remind us that when we talk in these very theoretical conceptual terms that we're talking about something very real and something, you know, that's excruciatingly painful and cause, you know, we're talking about death and violence. And, and so perhaps it's not appropriate to show these images, but on the other hand, they're images of what we're talking about. So I, I don't mean them to be shocking, I just mean them to remind us of the subject here. And I'm also going to talk about some things that are difficult for me to talk about and maybe difficult for you to hear about, especially if you or people you love have been victims of this kind of violence, or if you have perpetrated this kind of violence, it won't be easy to talk about. Um, so this is uh, more than many topics uh, difficult to present and difficult to listen to, so um, I apologize for that, but I think violence is something we really deeply need to understand, um, so I think we ought to talk about it. Um, also, a great deal of research has been done on the point of view of the victims, what it's like to experience violence. That's not what I'm talking about. That's very important. It's crucial to understand what happens to people when they suffer violence, but I'm trying to understand what the causes of violence, the sources of violence, uh, and in particular the psychological motives for violence. Okay? Now, when we do that, especially when we do that from a kind of anthropological point of view, we're trying to get in the minds of the perpetrators, trying to see why they're doing what they're doing, and it may seem to you sometimes that by explaining we are justifying. I don't think that that's the case. Uh, to understand something, to understand why people do something isn't to say that it's the right thing to do, even to say that something is natural or part of the natural world or part of the human you know, disposition is not to justify it from our moral point of view. But this is very tricky here because we're going to, we have to take a meta-ethical a meta point of view on some ethical issues here. So we have to keep track of what level we're on. And I'll try to keep reminding us of that. but. Um, this is an especially difficult one to do. So when we see the perpetrator's point of view, when we try to understand it, that doesn't mean that we think, that we judge that the perpetrator, even though it's coherent and meaningful and sensible from the perpetrator's point of view, that doesn't mean that we, that we should approve of it, okay? So let's, let's just keep track of those kind of difficult things. Um, so violence, it's a part of the world, it's a part of, you know, everyday life. I mean, we have violent sports, um, uh, you know, from football and American football and rugby and, and boxing and mixed martial arts and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, if you, you know, the research shows that within families there's a great deal of violence in many social classes in many communities around the world. Um, and of course, in many states, including the United States, the government itself um, uh, does violence, both in policing, uh, you know, the police use violence and feel entitled to use violence, but also the state itself, uh, after due consideration, 
uh, executes people still. Many of the states in the United States, and very rarely but occasionally the federal government, uh, engages in capital punishment. So violence is something important to understand. And I myself am a pacifist. I'm opposed to all violence. Um, but uh, the more opposed to it I am, the more I feel uh, obligated to look at it. And I think to reduce it, we have to understand it. OK? Um, so the question is, why are people violent? Why do they do the horrific things that they do to each other? Um, well, is violence in our evolutionary nature? Is it, is it something that we can't get around? That's something that Conrad Lorenz argued about 60 years ago in his book on violence. Um, and evolutionary theories have argued that violence results from competition over scarce resources, that if there are valuable uh, food or shelter, or for males, if there are valuable mates, they may, uh, it may be adaptive to, to uh, coerce other individuals into, you know, to actually fight over those resources. Um, and um, nevertheless, even if we take an evolutionary point of view, we have to realize that for human beings, as we've talked about over the last few days, um, there is something else that's extraordinarily important for, for survival and reproduction in human beings that's not so important for many other species, in fact, not as important for any other uh, uh, mammalian species or vertebrate species, and, and that is uh, social relationships. Um, human fitness depends on social coordination. So taking an evolutionary point of view, uh, we might say, well, is it adaptive in any case for human beings to use violence to regulate their social relationships um, because human beings depend on their relationships? Now, <clears throat> remember that an evolutionary account is not a deterministic account. The fact that something is, uh, that we have evolved dispositions or capacities or tendencies uh, or capabilities of doing something doesn't mean that we never, ne therefore, are stuck doing them, okay? If <clears throat> human beings have evolved to maximize their reproductive success, but what do you see around the world? People use contraception. Uh, and so clearly an evolutionary account doesn't explain everything about human behavior. We can use our minds and our cultures to control our evolutionary dispositions. And if we couldn't do that, then there wouldn't be such a thing as contraception, for example, right? There wouldn't be celibate monks and so forth and priests, right? And there are. So we know that, uh, that evolution is not destiny, but we still should look at the evolutionary dispositions that are involved. Um, there are, in addition to the evolutionary accounts of violence, sociological and cultural accounts of violence. So we know that violence is related to social stratification and deprivation, to oppression and exploitation, um, and to, as Durkheim famously pointed out, to the breakdown of, of, of norms, of <clears throat> the, 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 the lack of norms, and um, And also that there are cultural norms supporting violence uh, there are societies of warriors, and there have been ever since the first civilizations. Uh, in fact, the first civilizations all over the world were, high, were warrior, the, the, the high societies, these great elaborate uh, societies that produced amazing architecture and art and very complex uh, civilizations and, and literature in many cases were extremely violent. I mean, look at our Greek ancestors. And they valued violence, and they lauded and applauded those who were excellent in violence. Um, more recently, there's been sociological work arguing that people use violence when they can't count on the state, right? They use violence to, uh, to uh, as self-help to, to regulate uh, their relationships. That is, to if somebody does something or threatens to take something of mine and you can't count on the third party, uh, you can't count on the, on the Leviathan to enforce regulations, then you have to take care of it yourself. Um, and. Uh, the other thing is, of course, that the state itself is, I mean, part of what defines a state, one of the most crucial things that defines the state is that uh, collective organization which uh, claims for itself the exclusive right to use violence, right? So that's what a state is. If they, the state says we have police and judiciary and, and penal uh, officers and we have the right to use violence and no one else does, right? Um, so that's one of the definitions of the state. So there are sociological accounts of violence. There are also many psychological accounts of violence. Um, 
So uh, one of the earliest theories of, of violence was that it results from frustration. You have a goal, you're trying to get at something, you can't get it, and somehow that turns to aggression. Um, also, um, at the other end is uh, are rationalist theories, rational actor theories that says that people simply calculate the costs and benefits of various strategies. One strategy is to use violence, and if the benefits of violence are outweigh the costs, then people will be violent. Um, Another uh, antithesis to that is the idea that violence results from loss of self-control, that people, <clears throat> people are sort of violent by nature, but civilization and um, mature, a mature psyche enable you to control that violence, but when, you, when somehow that, break, that control breaks down, uh, the, the animal violence, the bestiality comes out. Um, Related to that is a more contemporary theory uh, of moral disengagement where people simply don't perceive the current situation as moral and they just don't, they act in some way without even bringing moral considerations to bear on the situation. They just don't see a moral issue in what they're doing. Um, and <clears throat> related to that is also some work by Nick Hasselman and uh, my, my friend and colleague and a number of other people saying that violent, arguing that violence can result from failing to treat the other people as human agents who have moral rights. So if you see <coughs> other people as less than human, <coughs> well, then moral issues are not involved. So if I have a chair and I choose to burn the chair, chop it up, uh, you know, ignore it, not pay attention to it, you know, do whatever, shoot holes in it, that's not a moral issue, right? Because the chair has no moral standing, right? And if we treat other human beings as if they were rocks or trees, then of course, <coughs> what what is vi violence uh, uh, for them is simply non you know it's irrelevant and not not a moral issue if you don't treat other people as human agents with moral uh, <coughs> with moral rights. Um, other other issues uh, you know are if you have a stage theory of moral development, you may say well it, it's only when you reach the higher stages that you begin to see um, you begin to control violence properly. Uh, there's a good deal of psychiatric evidence that children who were victims of a great deal of violence themselves are more likely to perpetrate violence. Um, and there's evidence uh, that a certain proportion of people have damage to the prefrontal areas and that that can result in, that's related to the idea of loss of self-control. And we know that there is a dimension called psychopathy. It's not a categorical variable. It's not that some people are psychopaths and some people are normal. But there is a, something, a, a, a dimension that you can measure, and people vary in the extent to which they, uh, not, a, not the extent to which they understand moral rules, but the extent to which they have moral and emotional commitments to moral rules, the extent to which they have compassion or sympathy for other people, uh, the extent to which they have any kind of remorse if they do harm to other people. So people vary on that, and you can explain violence as an individual difference thing, uh, and say that some people just don't have any emotional and moral commitment to, to moral rules and no regrets if they do harm. Okay, so that there are people who are more prone to, to harm. And there is plenty of evidence that the, 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 the higher you are on psychopathy, uh, the more likely you are to be violent. But there are very few psychopaths, there are very few people who are high on psychopathy. Um, and uh, if you use a cutoff of the, on the standard scale of 30, it is a continuous measure, but if you use a cutoff of 30, which is the standard cutoff for research and other purposes, you know, maybe 1% or 1.5% or 2% of males are, are, are above that cutoff and maybe half that proportion for women. Um, and those people indeed commit more violence, okay? But they don't commit most of the violence in the world because there aren't enough of them, <laughs> okay? And because sometimes psychopaths are too smart to commit violence because they realize that that's not actually in their self-interest, they can get what they want. Uh, with less risk by not uh, being violent. Anyway, so there are a bunch of uh, psychological ideas. Um, so in sum, the, most theories of violence uh, perceive it as either something as, as a product of the structure of the society or as a pro structure or process of the individual mind. But the theory that I'm going to present, uh, developed with my uh, former student and colleague Tej Rai, is a different level, okay? What we call virtuous violence theory says that violence results not from primarily from some product, some characteristic of individuals, and not primarily from macro features of the society 
the structure of the society, but that it's a function of relationships. Okay? And that is a different level of explanation to talk about relationships as opposed to talk about properties of persons or properties of societies. Um, so our, our uh, theory posits that violence is a function of social relationships and more specifically and precisely that, vi that violence is morally motivated to regulate social relationships. Now I'll expand on that idea, but notice that right away, okay, that if, if we say that that violence is, is, uh, grows out of social relationships and is morally motivated to regulate relationships, we have to say, what, what do we mean by relationships and what do we mean by moral? Now, we've talked a good deal about relationships, but I want to back over, go over some kind of big picture ideas about that. Um, uh, well, second is supposed to be first, I'm sorry. Uh, or maybe this is a previous draft. Okay, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's it's just my error in the slide. It's supposed to be first. Um, and before, when we, when, if we're going to talk about what morality is, um, I want to take a perspective that is strange in some ways, so I want to give you some meta-theoretical background for why I'm taking this perspective, because it's not the perspective that most philosophers and indeed most psychologists take on, uh, on, on defining their constructs. Uh, especially morality. So um, I want to argue that a scientific construct, when it's intended to be descriptive, shouldn't, in this case the, the, the construct of morality, shouldn't be based on the folk or even the expert prescriptive models that are functioning in any particular society. That our scientific descriptions, uh, of course you should be aware of the, of the folk and the expert prescriptive models, but you shouldn't necessarily base your descriptive uh, theory or science on uh, either folk or expert uh, prescriptive theories. Um, and uh, also I want to say that introspection may be a poor guide. Now that's not to say that you should never introspect, but especially if you, that, that your interest, you may not have access to the psychological processes. We don't have access to very many of our own psychological processes. So we may not really understand how our minds work. And second, to the extent that you understand how our minds work, we know uh, that, that Western psychology, the psychology of educated Western uh, people, is very atypical of human beings. Uh, there's a wonderful paper by, paper by uh, Noren Zion and Heinrich and, and, and their colleagues at the University of British Columbia, uh, showing that on all psychological variables, in all psychological processes where we have really good data from people who are not college students and aren't from the West and aren't from modern and rich countries, the people who are from you know, college students and rich you know, these people, people who make up 95% of the participants in psychological experiments are atypical, really atypical, really outliers, okay? So if we are looking at our, the way our own minds work, they're probably, it's probably not a good guide, even if we understand our own minds, to how human minds in general work, because we're weird, okay? Um, nor should we rely on, on uh, language is a, is a wonderful tool, but we shouldn't simply rely on the terms and, 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 and the analysis of language to base our scientific theories. Again, <coughs> language can provide a lot of hints as to how the mind and society works, but we shouldn't mistake uh, the vernacular language for a good theory of the world. Now, I know that that's a little bit of a, you know, a lot of philosophers might argue with me there, but um, I'm going to argue that the everyday language doesn't provide necessarily the constructs that we need. Uh, and if you look at the history of science, you find that science advances. As it advances, it finds that the every, everyday language doesn't provide the, the constructs and concepts that it needs, and it develops new ones which, are, which differ from ordinary everyday language. Um, and I don't think we should rely on our folk psychology, okay, if we want to understand how the mind works. Uh, you might start by, you might assume that, well, people kind of know how their mind works because after all they have minds and they deal all the time every day with people who have minds. Uh, but it turns out I think that folk psychology, uh, again, although it's worth looking at and may provide hints and so forth, isn't the right, necessarily the right starting point. And of course there are many, there are thousands of folk psychologies as there are thousands of folks, thousands of cultures in the world. And so there's no reason to believe that any particular uh, one folk psychology is going to be a good guide. 
Um, so I'm saying um, that instead of doing those things, um, instead of using the, the everyday folk uh, concepts or the concepts of, uh, in the case of morality, of theologians and moral philosophers, um, we should develop our own scientific constructs and um, they should be based basically on the principle that you're trying to find natural kinds or entities in the world which interact in consistent ways um, with other uh, kinds of concepts in the world. So you should, uh, other kinds of constructs, and that you should largely do that inductively, okay? Um, so you want to uh, uh, cut nature at its joints, but you have to realize that the joints <laughs> in nature, when you're talking about human nature, are filtered and informed and, and, and oriented by culture. So finding the natural kinds is underneath all the cultural variability is very complex because nat nothing natural emerges in human beings without uh, being informed by and directed and oriented and infilled by culture. So you can't simply just look at the surface, you have to look at not only the surface, which is what's really going on and crucial to understand, but at, uh, at the cultural processes and the way they interact with psychological dispositions. Okay, so uh, uh, John informed me that this is called causal homogeneity, right? Uh, yeah, it's one account of natural cause. Yeah. It never is of a kind of common. Yeah, so the idea is that a natural kind, among other things, should, have, should be caused by a consistent set of all the entities in that set of things that, are, uh, that compose a natural kind, should have a, uh, be effects of some common causes, and that they should in turn uh, have common effects. They should cause common things. So that's one criterion, and probably the essential criterion that we're looking for in a good scientific construct. Um, so, with those meta with those meta-theoretical frameworks, which I understand are all arguable and may be very incompatible with the way you see the world and the way you work, but I thought I'd put them on the table. Um, we want to argue that moral psychology consists of emotions and motives and judgments concerning the regulation of social relationships. Okay? So the, 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 when we are thinking, feeling, judging morally, we are thinking, feeling, and judging about whether relationships are right or wrong, whether we're doing relationships, creating the relationships, or whether you are cre acting in a relationship the way you should or shouldn't, okay, toward me or toward a third party, and I, when I'm evaluating my actions, I toward you, okay? So moral psychology is about comparing our own and others' actions to our ideal models of how we should act in the world. And as we know from the work that we've been doing the last, uh, <coughs> the last 36 hours here, um, what would those mean? What would the ideals for relationships be? Well, they would be relational models implemented in culture-specific ways, and implemented in many different ways in each culture, and implemented differently, of course, across cultures. So moral psychology is the psychology of the implementation, the cultural implementation of relational models, and it's the process of comparing either our potential or past or actual action with those models, the, with, with, with the relational models, that is, with the cultural implementation of these basic models. Um, so, you know, more colloquially put, uh, moral psychology is the evaluation of whether people are uh, doing their relationships right or wrong, okay? Well, what does that mean? Um, in terms of, um, what does that mean in terms of uh, the, you know, the basic relational models? What is the morality of communal sharing? Well, um, you know, we talked about uh, various moral aspects of it, okay? But basically, um, uh, John Donne wrote a famous poem in which, uh, <clears throat> in part of which he says, uh, if you hear the bell tolling, okay, the church bell tolling for a death, don't, you don't need to ask whose death it is, because if it's anyone's death, it's part of yours, okay? And that's the, any, anyone's suffering, anyone's well-being also, uh, anyone's needs and concerns are your concerns. No man is an island isolated from other people. We are all part of each other, okay? So that's the morality of communal sharing. The, commun the, 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 the 
the morality of compassion and the morality of, of identification with each other's well-being. Um, so we can call that motive unity, okay? The motive to, to maintain the group or, or dyad uh, and to uh, feel that my loss and your loss, your well-being and my well-being are all the same, okay? What about authority ranking? Well, basically the the moral principle of authority ranking is obedience to the will of your superiors. Now those may be, may be your, your parents or your grandparents or it may be the ancestors who are no longer alive or it may be a superior God whose will, you know, who define for many religious people what is right is what God wills and that's the end of the story. Whatever God wills, you don't have to understand it, doesn't have to look consistent from situation to situation, God's will defines what's right and wrong. And respect and filial piety and devotion a deference to the will of superior beings, that is what morality is, okay? Um, but conversely, a part of the morality of authority ranking is the notion that the su superior social or, <coughs> or immaterial beings should look out for, guide, lead, protect, uh, provide a shield for, and speak up for subordinates, okay? So we can call that motive, that moral motive hierarchy, um, and it's the motive to respect and sustain social hierarchy, okay? Um, equality matching, well, the morality, that's pretty obvious, it's equality. We, a, a part of every moral system in the world, uh, one of the moral frameworks that we use is we ask whether people are being treated equally and evenly. Now, who gets to who gets to be treated equally is, of course, culturally variable. So, do women get treated equally with men? Do non-citizens get treated equally with citizens? Do children get treated equally with adults? What's a, what's a child, what's an adult, and so forth and so on. Uh, those are all culturally variable issues. But culture, all we recognize some kind of principle about equality among people who ought to be treated as equals, right? Um, uh, and strict reciprocity of the morality of both positive and negative tit for tat in kind reciprocity. Um, and um, uh, for those of you who are moral philosophers, in a way, Rawls's veil of ignorance is, is based on the notion that, well, if you have an equal chance of being anybody in society, what kind of society would you choose to have? So the, the, that, that heuristic for, choose, for deciding on what would count as moral is really, in, in some sense, based on a lottery notion <laughs> that, that you should choose a moral system in which you would be willing to participate in a lottery where you could be have an equal chance of being anybody. Obviously if the lottery is uneven and you think you're more likely to end up as a certain kind of person, then you wouldn't then the whole idea of the veil of ignorance fails. Um, so it's the motivation to be even or to be on the same level. Okay? So that's the, the moral motive uh, <coughs> of equality and it's pretty self evident. It's part of uh, all moral systems. Market pricing has a, is a morality of proportional justice proportional reward, proportional punishment, uh, giving each person their due according to their merit, um, and uh, that can include uh, uh, comparing all kinds of apples and oranges in, in evaluating the merit, positive or negative, of somebody. In many, many world, uh, in many religions from Egyptian uh, and, and uh, uh, <coughs> to, um, to Islam and, uh, and some forms of Christianity and so forth, there's a notion uh, that uh, at the end of life, all the good and bad things you did are weighed and compared, and they all have weights that are comparable to each other, and there's a kind of cost-benefit analysis of whether you go to heaven or the, or the equivalent, or you go to hell or some, somewhere else, and for how long if you go to purgatory and so forth. Uh, it's, it's based, you know, it's like a judge judging a, a sentence to give you, uh, judging, you know, according to comparing all kinds of apples and oranges. Um, and utilitarian reasoning is, is the reasoning of, of is the moral reasoning of the of market pricing. It says we can compare all the good and bad things, outcomes of a possible act or a possible rule, and we can weigh them in the as if they're fungible, as if they're all in the same currency, and we can multiply the amount of this times the times the magnitude of this and the amount of that using the distributive law and so forth, and come out with a moral decision. Okay. Um, and notice that market pricing, unlike the other forms of morality, uh, you know, it says we can compare a sentence in days or a certain kind of torture, okay, a certain kind of imprisonment in a certain kind of facility for a period, certain period of time and compare that with all the guilt factors, 
okay, that go into this, is this the first crime, the second crime, was it premeditated, and so forth. And, uh, you know, the whole notion that you can do that is relies on a market pricing kind of mentality. So that's the, mo the morality of proportionality, okay? Now what I want to argue is that each of these moralities, when we think each of these moralities is a motive for violence. Now, if you think of violence, if, if you think of morality um, as many uh, psychologists and certainly philosophers as well, uh, but, but many psychologists have argued, well, no, morality, the basic taproot of morality, the f core and foundation of morality is avoiding harm. That people have an intuition, children have an intuition that doing harm is bad, and that is what grows into a more complex sense of morality. Uh, if, if that's what your understanding of morality is, then our theory makes no sense, right? But I'm arguing that, that, uh, the, that uh, avoid the sense that harm is bad and avoiding harm is not the basis of morality, although it can be in certain circumstances, but it's not fundamental to the notion of morality. That morality, at least, you know, you can put no, you can call it morality subscript, you know, uh, RF for Ryan Fisk, <laughs> okay? But when I use the word morality, I may be not using it the way you want to use it, okay? But when I use the word morality, I mean the regulation of social relationships, and I think that that will get us most of the where we want to go when we understand the things that we actually mean by morality, okay? So it's not an accident that I call it morality and not, uh, you know, binga banga boonga, okay? I'm using the word morality because I think it is really what we're talking about, uh, but it may not be the way you think you're using the term, or it may not correspond to the folk meaning of that term, but it's, it's, uh, there's a reason for using that word. But if you, you know, we could call it something else if you don't want to call it morality. But it's the construct, it's the, it's the way I'm defining the construct for this purpose, okay? Um, so, our theory is actually just almost the opposite of this. It's, it says that, that, that morality, in the, it, as the regulation of social relationships, uh, is not necessarily about avoiding harm. And that most of the time when people do harm to each other, they are actually morally motivated, okay? That violence is not primarily, uh, rarely results from the breakdown or the failure of morality, but it is morally motivated. Okay? Now, all these other theories uh, of these main psychologists of uh, moral development and morality uh, imply that people should always think that, that, uh, that, you know, that violence is wrong. But in fact, people don't always think that violence is wrong. Um, and uh, people do a lot of violence. And um, it's difficult for, the, for these moral psychologists to explain where this violence comes from unless they see that people are failing to be moral. But if you actually look at the motives of the people who are doing the violence, they, there's no evidence that they are failing to be moral. In fact, the evidence is exactly the other way around. That from the point of view of perpetrators, they are not only justifying their action morally, they are actually morally motivated that most perpetrators, most of the time, when they hurt or kill somebody else, or when they hurt or kill themselves, are doing it not just what they think is right, but what they feel is right. They are doing it because, they're doing the violence because they feel they should, they must, they ought to. Okay? So, um, our theory is that most violence, I mean, I don't know whether it's 60% or 98% or something like that, but, you know, so I don't know how much, it's not a quantitative theory, but it says that, you know, most violence, and the more I research we did on this, the more I'm persuaded that it is a very large proportion, um, is um, that people harm others or themselves because they genuinely feel that it's right. And not just that they do it for some other motive and then justify it. I'm not talking about how they justify it, okay? Because people, justification is a whole other issue, right? I'm not talking about how they justify it to themselves or how they justify it to other people, but what makes them do it in the first place, okay? Um, perpetrators know they are hurting. It's not a matter of uh, dehumanization or infrahumanization. It's not that people fail to perceive that they are causing pain and suffering and fear and death. Uh, that's exactly why they're doing it. 
people wouldn't do the harm that they do uh, unless they perceived, perceived that the victims were suffering and in pain and fear and dying, and that they were human beings who were in fear and in pain and in suffering and dying. Okay? So, you know, the argument is that across history and across cultures, and we, you know, of course there's no way to review this, the whole history of the world and all the cultures in the world, and, but we did look, take a very broad view, looking at, uh, you know, considerable depth in history, looking at whatever kind of data was available from all kinds of societies, from hunter-gatherers to agricultural societies without chieftains and, and uh, you know, to kingdoms and, and so forth, to early civilizations, to modern ones, to all kinds of cultures in the modern world and in recent history. Um, and what we find is that people doing violence are doing it because they feel they must, they should, they ought to, whatever terms you want to talk about it. They are, they are compelled, they are pushed, they are pulled, they are, they are motivated because, by their sense of what's right and wrong and what they have to do. Okay? At the moment they do it. Now, I'm not saying that people necessarily beforehand think it's right or necessarily think it's right afterwards. All I'm talking about is what motivates them to do it at the time they do it. Now, all motives wax and wane. You know, motives get stronger. We're, we have many motives, right? Including compassionate motives. It's part of the human equipment that we care about and love each other. And actually, violence is difficult to do. Okay? People have many motives not to do violence. One of which is that it's it, people. It, part of the human equipment is that it, people are upset at, at causing pain and suffering, dismembering other people or themselves and so forth. And also, of course, they're afraid that if you hurt, try to hurt somebody, they might hurt you, or their brother might come and kill you or something, okay? So there's, there's a whole complex of motives that are operating. And the balance of those motives may change over time. But what I'm saying is that if you look at what hap what's going on in somebody's mind, at the moment that they hurt or kill somebody, right, or hurt or kill themselves, what is going on right then is that they are feel that they have to do it. They feel it's right to do it. They feel they should do it at that moment, okay? Um, and that they're not crazy for the most part. Now some crazy people do violence, that, I mean, there are crazy people who do violence. It turns out they are also usually morally motivated, but most violence isn't done by crazy people. Most violence is done by very sane people, okay? And part of the definition of sanity is that their perception of what's right and wrong corresponds pretty well to their family, their peers, their reference group, okay? That other people around them uh, do the same kind of violence, condone what they're doing, say they would have done it in the same steps, and they say, good on you, good for you, you did the right thing. Okay? So, uh, people usually, when they are doing violence, are doing violence that makes sense to people like them. Okay? They're not solipsistically uh, thinking of the world in some weird way. Okay? Now, When, we, when people do violence to regulate or constitute, and I'm using those words interchangeably for right now, um, when, they, when, they, when people do violence to regulate or constitute relationships, what do we mean by that? What are the phases of relationships that motivate violence? Well, what are the phases of relationships at all? In that if you look at relationships dynamically, rather than as a static thing that just exists, but as a product that's constantly generated or produced, um, if you look at violence as something that is, that is not just a, I mean, if, sorry, if you look at relationships as something that, just, that isn't just a thing in the world, but is a process of complementarity that is inherently dynamic, um, then you can look at the phases of, of, a, of relationships, and they're not linear in order. They, they, you know, they, people can cycle through these in various directions and various orders. Um, but um, let's consider... Uh, Some of the, uh, well, this is out of order, but anyway, okay. So let's look at some kinds of violence. Um, many sports consist of violence, okay? That is, when people are doing violence, when people are doing the sport, uh, they're doing, they are, they are actually, uh, you know, the sport consists of regulated violence. So if you, if I, if, if you, if, 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 if uh, somebody tells you that they hit, somebody and hit him and hit him and hit him until they knocked, the person was knocked down and fell un unconscious, you say, whoa, uh, you know, that maybe not seem, might not seem right to you. But if I tell you that it was a boxing match, you say, oh, okay, 
Now, I personally don't approve of boxing, but most people, or many people, and the people engaged in it, and their fans, and so forth, and their coaches, and, and the referees all think that that's what you're supposed to be doing when you're boxing. You're supposed to hit the other person, and if you win on points, that's by hitting them harder and better, that's okay, but the real thing is to try to knock the other person unconscious. Okay? Well, the same is true of rugby and ice hockey and football. It's the, regu it's the regulated administration of violence, and the, whoever's better at it wins. Okay? Um, and um, we, you know, we had some, uh, we had, I had a student of mine interviewed some, some uh, high school and college football players, some really, including some at UCLA, who are really, really good football players, and they all say that the purpose of the game um, is to hit the other people and, and, and hurt them. And you, there's, of course, you should do so in a fair way, right? Uh, but that if that, that the goal of the people you admire, the people who are not only fellow football players admire, but the fans admire and the coaches admire, are people, you know, who uh, who, who who hurt other people effectively, okay? And when they're hurt, they say, "Wow, you know, that hurts." But good for you, okay? They admire their opponents. And in mixed martial arts and so forth, people are, are you know, when they're knocked down, when, they're, when somebody, in, in mixed martial arts, you win when the other opponent, you cause the other opponent such excruciating pain that they tap out, okay? They say, I can't take the pain anymore, okay? You win. That's the goal in mixed martial arts, in, in formal contests, is to cause the other person so much pain that they give up, okay? And then the loser usually admires and respects the person for defeating them, okay? So, um, you know, if you, if you talk about people, and this is just football, this isn't boxing or mixed martial arts, um, but they say that the goal is to, is to hit and hurt and scare the other people and maybe keep them on the bench for a few plays and maybe make sure that they don't ever try to come your way if you're the defense, for example, because they're afraid of you, okay? And, you know, the, the experts say that, that, you know, football is violence, and if you try to change all the rules and protect people too much so they can't get hurt, it wouldn't be football anymore, okay? Um, and, I, you know, ice hockey, rugby, uh, and so forth and so on, those are sports of the, the, that consist of the regulation uh, of organized, condoned violence. And um, these, are, these go way back in history, okay? So... You know, warriors and uh, cattle raiders, and you know, in the in the in the old West in the United States, the, the admired heroes. Who were they? They were the people who could draw fast and kill the other guy before he they get killed. So Billy the Kid is famous because he killed 21 other people in more or less fair fights. Right? Those are the heroes. Right? And the same was true. Uh, you know, of um, you know, uh, if you read accounts of 19th and and early 20th century boys on the playground, when a new boy showed up, he had to fight, or if he refused to fight, he was at the bottom of the dominance, you know, the authority ranking status thing. And if he fought, then he was, you know, it was just like a primate dominance hierarchy, okay? Um, and there are actual pain games that people, that men play, especially sometimes, where they say, hit me as hard as you can. And you try to see how much pain the other person can take. Or they, in some society, you know, there are stick games where they bash at each other's shins and so forth and so on. And these, are, these go on all over the world. And when, by winning, you increase your status, and, and it's legitimate status, okay? And if you lose, well, then you go down. And you deserve to go down. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so these are contests of violence that constitute authority ranking status hierarchies. Okay? And everybody thinks that those are legitimate. Um, so contests of violence in the, uh, in the age of chivalry, who was Sir Lancelot? He was the guy who was the best guy at killing other people, who, other knights in armor. And the knights went around, and they, whenever they saw another knight in armor, they just automatically fought. That was just what you did. You, you prowled around, and when you saw somebody else on a horse in armor, then the two of you got everything all set up and went at each other and tried to kill each other. Now, you could give the other person mercy and not when you got him down and you had your knife and could stick it through his helmet uh, visor. You could, give, you could decide to, to spare him. Uh, but whether you did or not, uh, whether you killed him or, or let him live, it was the person who was most effectively violent who was the winner. Um, and uh, got honor 
and was acclaimed and was the, was the paragon of, of, of manhood in those societies at that time. Um, so there are contests of violence, okay, in many societies and nearly all, not quite all, but nearly all societies, particularly among men, um, and which people uh, establish their position in an authority ranking hierarchy by being good at violence. Um, another context where people in all cultures uh, use violence in one way or another, um, and, and it's part of the moral, you know, really fundamental to the moral system, right, um, is, is punishment. Okay, so nowadays we use much less violent uh, and painful punishment than we used to, but people used to uh, put people on the rack, not simply to interrogate them, but as part of the process of punishing them for disloyalty, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, uh, for, um, you know for, for resisting the authority of, of the rulers and so forth, or for religious violations, right? And, you know, the, what is the symbol of Christianity? It's a, it's, a, it's, it, it's a person nailed to the cross. That's what they used to do. They, 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 they executed people in a way that took days to die, and it was excruciatingly painful, and everybody came and watched, okay? Men, men and women used to go to hangings and lynchings in the, in the, in the United, south of the United States and take home fingers and other body parts as, as souvenirs from the events. So uh, these, this is violence that is approved of by not only the state but the public in general. Now, of course, that doesn't mean everybody approves of every particular execution or every particular torture. The sister or the brother or you know, the father or the mother may think that it's wrong and so forth, and maybe larger segments of society. But in general, the people administering the violence and, and other people think that that's, you know, there could be an occasional miscarriage of violence, but they think that that violence of that kind is right and proper. Okay, this exists all over the world. Okay, so there's spanking and whipping and beating, deprivation, you know, I mean, People used to commonly, and still do in many uh, c communities, uh, cause their children, their own children, se severe pain and suffering uh, for disobedience, disrespect, uh, you know, blasphemy and so forth, failing, falling asleep when you're supposed to be herding the cattle and so forth. And, and it was considered that if you wanted to bring up a moral, God-fearing child, that that's the way you had to do it. And you didn't like hurting your children, right? But you thought that it was a moral obligation for a, a you know, for a parent to do to do that, and um, you know, there used to be it used to be that if you, there wasn't sufficient evidence in in, in, in Europe, uh, that, that there would be a trial by ordeal, okay, where people would be subjected to things like picking up a burning hot uh, iron weight with a handle on it, carrying it a certain distance, and then the priest, okay, the moral authority would go check two days later and see how bad, see if they were burned. <laughs> Okay, and if they were burned, that showed they were guilty. If they weren't somehow miraculously burned, they must be innocent. Okay, and so this, um, you know, this and, and worse tortures were, uh, you know, trial by ordeal. This was this was violence that the church and the magistrates and and the barons and so forth, everybody approved of as the proper way to do justice. Okay, um, and of course, uh, and then trial by combat, another form of this and so forth, and execution, uh, which always, you know, recently. The few, the few uh, nations that still do execute people try to do so very quickly and painlessly, but execution used to be done in most cultures uh, often in a very excruciating and drawn out way. Okay? Um, so punishment constitutes all kinds of social relationships, but it tends to be used most often in the context of authority ranking um, to establish and, or reestablish or redress the authority that's been challenged um, of somebody of higher status. <laughs> um, and, you know, what it, constitutively what it's doing is to uh, redress the transgressed relationship, okay? And these are, these are images that seem either horrific or laughable today, but these are images of what was good parroting 100 or 150 years ago in most places in the world and still today in some places, right? Okay, so we've looked at Contests of violence, we've looked at punishment, what about war? Well, except for the Quakers, the, the Society of Friends, the Amish, the Mennonites, and uh, 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 some Buddhists and so forth, most people in the world uh, believe that there are just wars and that it is just and proper and glorious 
to go to war under certain circumstances, and that means systematically uh, terrifying, injuring, and killing the enemy, and in some cases raping the enemy. Okay? Well, why do people go to war? Well, there are two, there are two levels here. There's why does the government, the, you know, <coughs> whatever it is, go to war, and there are why do individual soldiers go to war. So let's look at the let's look at the the, the motives of the people who the, the, the political leaders. Okay, well, people have studied why people why political leaders go to war. Of course, it's difficult sometimes to distinguish between pure rhetoric and their actual motives. But even if you look at the rhetoric, you have to assume that they're uh, directing their rhetoric at people who believe in the kind of arguments they're making. Otherwise, it wouldn't make wouldn't, the rhetoric wouldn't be effective. So they're, the leaders are at least appealing to what the, the, the moral frameworks that they think they're, the people they're trying to appeal to uh, believe in. But also sometimes you can really get enough detail and depth to find out what the, what the leaders themselves thought. And if you look at, at, um, at, at what people have, uh, what historians have found were the, were the root causes of war, um, you find that seeking justice was a major factor in modern wars, okay? Especially the Crimean War and World War I. Um, and in the Falkland Maldives War, for example, um, think about Margaret Thatcher. She seems the paragon of dispassionate rationality, right? But what did she say? Why did she say they were engaging in the Falkland War? Because it was economically rational? No, it was about honor. It was about, we can't let them dishonor us, okay? We can't let them violate the rule, the, the rule of international law. She argued for sending troops to die and to, and to kill Argentinian troops, right, and sailors and airmen, um, because it was the morally right thing to do. That was her argument, okay? Aggressors should never succeed, and international law should prevail over the use of force. We were defending our honor as a nation, okay? And it turns out that this is exactly what seems to motivate uh, uh, leaders to go to war over and over again. Um, and in particular, nations are very concerned about their status, their ranking. And, and when they perceive the action of another nation to be an insult that degrades them, that lowers their status, they are very likely to go to war. So if you look at all the big wars, all the wars that involve big powers since 1648, okay? 58% um, of those wars were, of course, wars have multiple causes, but they were primarily over standing. In other words, authority ranking position, right? Stature relative to each other. 10% um, were about revenge. You did this to us, so we're going to do that back to you. That's a moral thing. 18% were about security, and you could argue that, I don't know, you know, conceptually, how is that coded? Is that a moral or non-moral thing? It may be moral from the point of view of the leaders, feeling they have to, they should, they have a moral obligation to protect their followers. Um, and so only seven percent seem to be sort of self-interested, uh, just you know, getting more territory or something like that. Okay. Now, of course, it's difficult to code these and so forth, but this is still a coding of 94 wars, right? And pretty carefully done and published in major journals and so forth. Okay. So it looks like an awful lot of wars are uh, engaged in by people who are trying to regulate relationships. Now, of course, self-interest and economic factors are often involved, but my colleague uh, Rick McCauley, uh, in his analysis of, of, of warfare, uh, uh, inter-ethnic violence uh, and especially, uh, has argued that self-interest is never sufficient. That self-interest may be one of the, you know, one of the uh, important causes of, 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 of conflict, but that really wars are fought uh, and, and, and uh, civil wars and genocide and so forth when people feel that there's a moral issue um, at stake. In another, in he, one place he's quoted as saying, you know, when people start talking about right and wrong uh, in a conflict situation, you bring out the body bags because that's when they're going to start killing each other. Okay. And this is not a modern phenomenon. If you look at the earliest great civilizations uh, that developed art and architecture and, and social structures to a very and religion to a very complex d degree, they all valorized warfare, and their heroes were warriors. Okay, um, every one of these early cultures, okay, uh, they all 
um, they all thought that the, the, the you know the, the pinnacle of honor and, and, and manhood was to be a great warrior, to be really good at killing other people, and to do and that it was morally right to do so. That you should uh, applaud and admire those who were great warriors. If you read if you read the Iliad, it's all about admiring the good killers. Okay, so that's war. People do a lot of what about self-injurious behavior when people hurt themselves? Okay, people do a lot of in, in a number of religions. People hurt themselves. They flagellate themselves uh, or scourge themselves. Uh, this is true in in Shia Islam. It's true in certain uh, periods in Christianity. Uh, and many others that don't actually many other religious traditions and individuals that don't. Uh, uh, cause bloodshed, still deprive themselves of food, sleep on cold stone benches, uh, <clears throat> wear hair shirts that are extremely uncomfortable, minimize food and uh, avoid sex and so forth. Um, and the, you know, the, the pinnacle of this is the giant ideal in which if all living things, not only animals but plants, are a share in the divine spirit, then to consume any of them is to is to destroy what I'll translate here as spirit and so a mature monk in, in the ideal case in the, doesn't happen very often but does it definitely happens uh, the, the ideal giant will stop eating because to do so uh, would be you know it's a choice of one kind of violence or, or another do violence to others or let yourself die and they would choose not to do violence to others um, so there's Shia Muharram, where they're, they're, they're mourning the death of uh, Hussein ibn Ali uh, and, and his defeat at Karbala in 680 AD when, um, when there was a dispute over the caliphate, uh, that is, the, the, who should succeed in the third, of, uh, third generation after, after Muhammad, who should become the next religious and political leader. Um, and uh, they, they caused themselves uh, tremendous uh, pain and injury, especially uh, in, in Pakistan, uh, although also there's some of this uh, in Iran, although it's been outlawed there, and some even in London and other places like that. Um, the American Indian uh, vision quests, uh, so Plains Indians and Indians in other parts of uh, Native North America, uh, young men uh, sought to find a guardian spirit, okay? And the way to connect to this guardian spirit was through extreme asceticism, expose yourself to, to, to dangerously cold conditions, to uh, extreme uh, thirst, uh, or to inflict excru excruciating pain on yourself. That was the way that you would attract and connect to the spirit. Um, so uh, they would, so for example, they'd drive wooden pins in through the, through the muscles here, tie them to a pole, okay? Uh, early in the morning with the help of an assistant, the assistant would leave and then the person would pull and yank at this until he ripped the, 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 the pins right through at, at the end of many hours, uh, all with no water in the hot, uh, in the hot sun. Um, and um, if you needed to reestablish uh, connection to the, to the guardian spirit, uh, you might make a sacrifice uh, of, of a finger digit or something like that. Okay, and this was religion. This was the it wasn't crazy people doing stuff. This is what you should do. Okay, you should cause yourself tremendous pain and injury uh, in order to connect to your spirit guardian, and th then your spirit guardian would give you powers and uh, <clears throat> make you uh, able to do the things that you wanted to do. And if the, and often people did this on behalf not only of themselves but the community as a whole, especially in periods of drought or or, or community danger. Um, and so religious self-mortification um, constitutes authority ranking between mourners and gods. And also when people are doing it collectively, as in, as in Muharram, or when people are uh, flagellating themselves uh, in some way uh, or imitating the passion of Christ, okay, then it creates a very strong sense of communal sharing, a very intense sense of being one with others. Um, and uh, it both sustains and enhances these relationships, uh, and it's very important in many religious practices. 
Um, so we've looked at um, contests of violence, we've looked at punishment, we've looked at war, we've looked at religious self-mortification, um, but also um, in many societies uh, people do body modification of various kinds, cutting or scarring the face, and of course uh, uh, they do circumcision, excision, genital surgery of one kind or another, and in many cases this is not intent, the, the pain is not the purpose, okay? But in some cases it is. In some cases the whole point is that the uh, when it's done at adolescence, especially, uh, the man or the woman, the boy or the girl who's being initiated, who's being having the surgery done, uh, is supposed to uh, prove himself or herself by showing, being absolutely imperturbable and being completely unmoved by the pain. And if they cry or squirm or try to avoid this, uh, they're humiliated and, they, and, and nobody, you know, they're completely demeaned and derogated. Uh, it's to show that you're a man or to show that you're a woman, you not only have to have your body modified in this way, but you have to do it willingly, happily, and without any, any sign of, of pain or fear. Um, and everybody regards this as painful, yes, but necessary. This is the morally right thing, the way to make a man or to make a woman. Um, and uh, people do not only genital surgery, but, you know, in some parts of the world you have to, you, in parts of Africa they knock out a tooth, in Bali in other places they file the teeth, it's very painful. It's part of your creation of the, you know, as an identity thing. In many warrior cultures uh, there are really brutal initiation rites uh, that you don't want to hear about because they're extremely degrading and extremely painful, okay? And what it does is it makes the, the young men extremely loyal to each other and willing to die and sacrifice for, for each other and for the community. Um, and you find that that's true not only in <coughs> uh, traditional warrior societies, uh, but in some modern societies as well. If you want to join a, a, a gang in East or South Los Angeles, okay, what's the first thing they're going to do? They beat the hell out of you. Okay, you, you decide to join the gang and they just kick and punch and knock you down and smash you to pieces and that's the very first step in being part of the gang. You can't be part of the gang until they've done that. Okay, and everybody says, yeah, of course it hurts, but it makes you a member of the gang. Um, and uh, if you look at the Mai Mai militia, both the people that they kidnapped and the people who, who, who uh, joined voluntarily, these militias in the Eastern Congo, uh, they did the same thing, okay? They beat the crap out of the, the young boys who were joining, and it beat the civilianness out of them, as they said. It beat their, beat out of them their attachment to their parents and family and so forth. In some cases, they had to shoot family members, but they were invariably beaten as part as the first stage. And everybody thought, well, that's what you do. That's how you make a loyal member of the community. Okay, it's horrible, yes, but and everybody who does it and who is subjected to it feels tremendous pain and suffering, but they feel that it's necessary, that this is the way you create the moral uh, bonds that you need to create. Otherwise, without them, you don't have the loyalty, you don't have the, the, the commitment. Um, so this flogging was, was something that was generally not only tolerated, but thought to be right and necessary. And, you know, you find the same thing in modern boot camps which are getting less and less like this, but if you want to join the military, it used to be, and to some degree still is, that you have to undergo a great deal of pain. Uh, forced marches and, you know, and, um, you know, millions of push-ups until you're getting cramps and, and uh, being outside in tremendous cold and sometimes being beaten up by the, by the drill sergeants and so forth and so on. Uh, and a great deal of fear as well as, as, well as pain. Uh, there's less and less of that, but they used to be commonplace. Um, so these body modifications and pain testing are usually uh, constitute primarily communal sharing and they typically create a new relationship that didn't exist before. That's what's going on. Uh, people are being made a part of something, a gang or a member of adult society uh, or whatever or a warrior age grade that they didn't, that, you know, so they're creating a new relationship. What about homicide? What about when people kill each other? Why do they kill each other? Well, first of all, who is most likely to kill you if somebody kills you? Some stranger? No. Somebody you know very well. You're most likely to be killed by a friend or family member or 
as part of, of uh, by an acquaintance or even sometimes by a stranger, but always after a social interaction. It's, you're quite unlikely to be killed by a complete stranger. It, it happens. But mostly people are killed by people they know or people whom they are interacting with just before they get killed, right? And the studies that, of this, of, of what happens you know, immediately before and sometimes in the preceding hours or days are that most homicides are about something in a relationship. Somebody standing up for themselves, somebody uh, getting back at somebody for an insult, somebody getting at some, you know, somebody uh, who wants to hurt or kill somebody who's messing with their girlfriend uh, or, so, or somebody who's, uh, you know, killing her boyfriend because he was cheating on her and that sort of thing. They are the regulation of social relationships. Most homicides are not instrumental. They are making the relationship right in one way or another. And it turns out that that's not only true in modern societies, but the data are generally are not as good. But when you look at uh, this a fair amount of data by Bohannon and others in African societies, and it looks like the, uh, the, the proportion of homicides that result from regulation of social relationships is at least as high and probably a good deal higher in traditional societies. Um, so here's an example. Guy is a gang leader. One of his gang members bought crack cocaine, but the cocaine was bad. He was cheated. So he went, the gang leader has to stand up for and look out for and protect his gang members. So he goes to the seller of the crack and says, what you, you know, what are you doing? You're, you know, you cheated my gang. And the, and the guy, the, 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 the drug seller is afraid, you know, can see that he might be, be, be attacked by the gang leader, starts to pull out a gun, and the gang leader kills him. Okay? And he's not ashamed of this. He, doesn't th he thinks he's standing up for his guy, his homeboy. Okay? He's proud of that. This is what makes him a leader, that people can count on him. Okay? Here's another case. <clears throat> a man and his wife were arguing. They're both drunk. There's friends there. And she says, uh, you know, she, he is constantly insulting her in a, it's not a half joking, it's sort of a joke, but it's a very demeaning way, insulting her, calling her names and so forth in front of her friends, in front of their friends. And she says, stop it. And he keeps going. And she says, stop it or I'm going to kill you. And he keeps doing it and she does. She kills him. Okay? And there, you know, this is, this is typical. This is, what, this is what happens in a homicide. You say, well, it was just an insult. Well, it was just an insult. But she told him to stop. He didn't stop. So homicide can constitute all kinds of relationships, regulate all kinds of relationships, uh, redress them, uh, and, uh, but it is an important part of the regulation of social relationships, and that's usually what homicide is about. It's usually not instrumental, uh, it, although occasionally it is. It's mostly people making relationships right, people redressing them. Sometimes people have to create a relationship, like uh, you may can't get into this gang until you kill a member of the opposing gang or something like that. Uh, but it's usually regulating an existing relationship, redressing it, uh, retaliation, and that sort of thing. So it defends or terminates or redresses or preempts violations of those relationships. Now this is the hardest subject to talk about, but rape? Why do people rape? Well, you might think they rape for sex, but that's very rarely true. The evidence is that when people rape, they are trying to assert, when men rape, they are trying to assert what they feel is their legitimate authority ranking position, their dominance over this woman or over women in general. They are trying to restore or reassert their position as superior over subordinate women or over womankind in general. Um, And they feel that they are entitled to do this. Now, another thing that happens is that sometimes a group of men rape a woman, and all the accounts of it show that, you, that the, the people who did so felt that they couldn't not participate or they would be driven out of the group, they'd be excluded from the group, that they had to join in once it had started uh, in order to feel like they belonged and in order for other people to allow them to, to stay in the group. And 
they're, 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 they're joining in this thing was, is, is important in actually sustaining and enhancing the solidarity of the rapists. And amazingly, if you look at the literature on both uh, you know, lower class gang rapes and fraternity kind of gang rapes, the, the, the reports of this, and there's actually a very good ethnography by Peggy Sanday, an anthropologist at the University of Pennsylvania who looked carefully at these gang rapes, um, but also other people who've researched them, the rapists often are astonished. I mean, you think, what? How? It's inconceivable. But they think, they're, they're, they're surprised to find out that the rest of the society doesn't approve of this. Not only doesn't approve of it, but thinks it's horrible and horrific and deeply criminal. Because from their point of view, it's just like, well, well we were buddies, you know? This is what we're doing, okay? And they're, so at the one hand, on the one hand, they're asserting, the individual rapist and often the group rapist is asserting what they feel is their entitlement to dominance, um, but also uh, at the same time, uh, in, in, in group rape, whether it's uh, in, in, in civilian context or often in military context, uh, sometimes military officers uh, command their their soldiers to rape. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's it's you know it's, it's it's done more spontaneously, but it's an act of uh, can be an act of obedience in an authority ranking relationship. It can be an act of uh, but it's. Uh, in, in warfare, it's a way of humiliating and subordinating the defeated people. By raping women, you're uh, putting their, the menfolk who should have defended them down and disgracing the entire population, okay? And asserting your superiority over them. Sometimes the, the rape is not only about the particular person who is raped or persons who are raped, but the victims stand, you know, represent, in a collective sense, all women, or a whole category of women. Um, so uh, it's not that the that the perpetrator thinks is, is so much trying to establish dominance and legitimate what he feels is legitimate dominance over the victims, but over women in general. Okay. Now, you know, this is just hard to talk about, and I'm sure it's you no, know, it's hard to listen to. And if you've been raped or you know somebody who's been raped, you know, what what. What, what was more horrific than to imagine that the rapist thinks they're doing the right thing? I mean, I, I just, you know, it's just awful, okay? But, I, you know, you have to separate your view as a scientist from your feelings as a human being, okay? So I'm not, you know, to say that the rapist feels like they are doing what they ought to do and what they're entitled to do, it's just, it's horrific to think that. <laughs> It's a horrific to theorize that, but that's what the evidence suggests. And if we want to reduce rape, like we want to reduce any kind of violence, I think we have to we have to understand what's going on in the mind of the perpetrator, however repugnant and un, you know unthinkable that is. Um, we can't blind ourselves to what the evidence seems to indicate. So, yeah, what about suicide? Another very difficult topic. Why do people kill themselves? And also, I'm going to talk primarily about suicide, but the same thing is true of non-suicidal self-injury. Well, again, the evidence is that when people uh, hurt or kill themselves, um, they're doing so um, uh, because of relational conflicts, because of the breakup of a relationship, uh, which they feel they can't, either they can't survive without the relationship or they want to punish the people who have abandoned them or, or, or broken up with them um, because they feel they failed in some way. Um, uh, so in East Asia, there are a fair number of suicides of people who, where their families have put all their financial resources and all their time and energy into helping you know, a young student uh, to do well on the exams and the student does poorly, they feel they've failed the entire family and they sometimes commit suicide. Um, fighting with a parent, guilt and shame, uh, or uh, dishonor of one kind or another. <coughs> uh, a person may commit suicide if, they, if they've been sexually dishonored uh, or if they, um, you know, military officers in some military traditions, uh, including in Japan, for example, but also <coughs> in the, at the height of militarism in in 
uh, Central and Western Europe, uh, military officers who failed, who were, you know, who defeated, were defeated or made errors, uh, felt that they could only make recompense by killing themselves. They couldn't survive anymore without their honor as a military officer. Um, so suicide constitutes communal sharing and authority ranking relationships, and it kind of repairs and restores or preempts violations of those things. So sometimes uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Chinese history, for example, if a woman was, looked like she was going to be raped, she would either or, or was um, vulnerable to sexual abuse of one kind or another, women uh, traditionally would sometimes disfigure themselves horribly or kill themselves, and then they were honored forever. Okay, shrines were built to these women who preserved their honor uh, by disfiguring or killing themselves. Um, and, and of course, women have, in other societies, have killed themselves rather than be dishonored. Um, so this is just a sample, but um, if you look at other kinds of violence, where violence is any case where somebody, in our definition, where somebody is intentionally trying to do harm, cause pain or suffering or death to himself or to somebody else, uh, where the where the pain or suffering or death, uh, the distress is, is 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 a necessary means to the end, not not cases where you cause pain because you have to because it's the only way of you know curing the person of the disease or something, but where the pain is in, is, is, is 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 the direct purpose or a direct means to the end. And we've looked at every kind of violence that we could think of, uh, every kind of ways that people. I mean, believe me, this is was not fun to do for two years to read about all the awful things that you know, people in every society, you know, throughout history. I mean, just, to, oh, let's go look at another kind of violence for a while. How about human sacrifice? You know, and it's like, I mean, just gives you nightmares to read this stuff. But that's the fact, okay? That people doing harm are hurting and killing to realize the relationships that they feel they must realize, to regulate, to rectify, to redress relationships that they ought to, that they feel that they have to regulate or redress. Um, and um, so, interestingly enough, th this is true of every phase of relationships. So, to, to create relationships, people do violence. To sustain and enhance and modulate relationships, people do violence. To defend relationships, to protect them and against the, you know, danger from other people or, or, or the loss of relationships. Um, to redress a relationship that's been transgressed. Okay, um, and also to terminate relationships. We haven't talked about that so much, but. Sometimes the relationship becomes intolerable and the person kills themselves or kills the other person because the relationship is everything. They can't live without the relationship and uh, the relationship is so intolerable that they, that one or both of them, sometimes it's a murder-suicide, sometimes it's murder, sometimes it's suicide, people will kill themselves uh, to terminate the relationship. Another thing that I knew about but had, didn't really know, I had no idea about the prevalence of but it turns out that people do a lot of violence to mourn relationships. So when somebody dies, in a great many of societies around the world, the men or the women or both run around right afterwards with weapons or burning embers or whatever they make you bring to hand, and they injure themselves severely and they injure other people. Okay? So it's very common in, in a number of societies that the moment of death is a moment of violence. When people uh, you know, gash, this is a true in one of Australian Aboriginals, uh, it's very well described, uh, they gash their thighs or they, they, they you know, bang, bang themselves on the head or so forth, it's true in Tahiti. It's true in, a, uh, I don't have the, the figures are in the book and I've forgotten the proportion, but self-injury and injury of kind of random other people um, now, sometimes it's very prescribed violence. The people in a certain kinship relationship are supposed to cut themselves on the thigh, and other people are supposed to cut themselves on the arm, and so forth. And sometimes it's more chaotic. It's just like, hurt somebody and hurt yourself, okay? And then in a number of societies, so among Australian Aboriginals of, in, some of the, in some of the communities, after doing this, they 
go out and they find and they kill the first person they find. Doesn't matter who it is. Or among the Kwakiutl, and then later, if they hold somebody responsible for the death, for as a you know, they decide somebody was a sorcerer, then they kill him too. But the first person they kill is just anybody. Among the Kwakiutl in the northeast uh, part of the United States, uh, people felt that people were very, very competitive and very easily humiliated and hated to be put down in any way. And they felt that death was a humiliation. They felt demeaned and belittled by death. And so if a noble family uh, lost a princess, you know, she died. She could have died by drowning or get sick or something, OK? They would go on a war party. And they'd say, why should we grieve by ourselves? This is humiliating. This is terrible. Why should we suffer? And you're OK. That's not fair. You know, why should we be below you? Because we're suffering. So they would cut off the head of somebody else of equal rank. Um, they would even go to people that they knew who would feed them and say, oh, we're so glad to see you. And, and then they would say, you know, my sister died. And they'd go and kill the people who had just fed them. Okay? So the Kwakiutl felt humiliated by death, and so they would go kill somebody of equal rank, or sometimes several people, behead them, is what they did. Uh, or the Alonga in the Philippines, when somebody died, they had this sense of weight and this sense of repression. And uh, so they would go, young men especially, would go uh, and try to get an adult male to lead them out, and out of the village, go as far as they needed to go, and kill the first person they found. It didn't matter whether they were a one or, or anybody else. It didn't matter man, woman, boy, girl. Cut off the head. And whoever threw the head on the ground was treated like a great hero. And came, would come back. And everybody would feel a sense of catharsis and relief. Okay? So this turns out that, that, that mourning the dead. And of course, there are many societies in which people sacrificed people. Uh, to, when somebody, uh, when, when a no, noble or a king died, his, his, his wives, his retinue, his servants, and so forth, other nobles or enemy uh, captives would be, would be killed uh, along with him or her uh, and, and buried with them. So sacrifice along, you know, killing humans uh, in sacrifice to accompany uh, a dead person is very common. So every phase in the, in the dynamics of relationships, okay, from creating to enhancing and, reg and, 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 and reg to uh, modulating relationships, uh, repairing transgressions of relationships, uh, terminating relationships, and mourning relationships can be a moral motive for violence. So no matter what it is you're trying to do with a, in a relationship dynamically, uh, violence can be one way that people do that. Um, well, I think I'm going to stop here. I'm just, there, I, there's plenty more to talk about. But I just want to make one crucial point, OK? Violence can be motivated to regulate the relationship in which it occurs, OK? So if you insult me, maybe I kill you, OK? But often violence involves regulating another relationship. So I want to join John's gang, and John won't let me in his gang until I kill somebody in the opposing gang and you're somebody in the opposing gang. Okay, so I'm not regulating my relationship so much with you, although there's a little bit of that. I'm, I want to join. I want to regulate my relationship with John, so I kill somebody else. Okay, so there's a great deal of violence in which. So if you want to understand violence, you have to not look only look at the relationship between the the perpetrator and the victim, but the relationship that the perpetrator has with a bunch of other people and their relationships with the victim and so forth. Now it can go both ways. Those other relationships can push you toward violence or can push you away from violence, OK? So if you insult me, but you're my sister-in-law, I, I might not be violent, OK? Because I would hate to get my brother sad and, and, and angry at me. So OK, you've insulted me. Normally, I would kill you, but you're my sister-in-law, so I'm not going to do that, OK? So the other, the, the, the other relationships that enter into these constellations can either uh, make violence more likely, or can be, in fact, the functional purpose of the aim of violence, or they can restrain violence. So to understand where violence occurs and where it doesn't occur, 
okay? So I may kill you as a, you know, to sacrifice to the god. I don't have anything against you. I just need somebody to sacrifice to the god so the gods will appreciate and take care of me and so forth. And I, it's not personal, okay? So don't take it personally, okay? I'm just cutting you open and taking your living heart out just because, you know, the gods need that and, and, and I need the gods' protection. Don't worry about it. Don't take it, you know, don't take it to heart, okay? Uh, so there's a lot of violence that isn't about the relationship between the, the, so you can't just look at the dyad. You have to look at the larger configuration of relationships. And that's certainly true of honor violence of all kinds, people sustaining their honor, people killing their daughters or sisters or, or, or nieces. Uh, it's true of a, a great deal of violence that it's uh, about not just or sometimes not at all the relationship in which it occurs that between the, the two people involved, but uh, as a function of the other people involved. And you could do a wonderful, I have a whole talk about, uh, about the Iliad and about the configurations of relationships, and there are lots of them, <laughs> the configurations of relationships that, that, that motivate the violence in, in, in the Trojan War, okay? It's all about the relationships among relationships, and for example, you know, um, if your brother's honor is insulted, then you have to defend, help defend his honor because his honor is your honor, and so you have to not only try to make war against and kill the people who who insulted his honor, but their brothers and their allies, and so your brothers and your allies and their allies are killing the brothers and allies and so forth. You know, you get this complex pattern of, of relationships in which people are going after each other because of things that other people did, right? And that's very common. And, and also, in many societies, there's this sense of collective responsibility. Oh, one of those people did something to one of us. So let's, where's one of, oh, here, here, you're one of those people, I'll kill you, okay? And even though I don't think that you did anything involved, but you're one of them. So when a Sikh, when one of uh, Indira Gandhi's Sikh bodyguards killed her, Hindus all over India killed Sikhs, random Sikhs. Okay, because a Sikh had killed Indira Gandhi, and so in some bizarre way. Now, <coughs> there were, you know, there was a sense of collective responsibility. So, in looking at this, one has to um, look at the whole configuration of relationships, and, and the, the meta-relational models, or the, the, the relations among the relations, can either constrain violence, okay, because you're a member of, of my club and because you're married to my brother and because, you know, you're, you and I are co-religionists and so forth, okay, you've insulted me or, you know, <coughs> whatever, uh, so, but, uh, but because of those other ties, it isn't going to work for me to hurt you, I'm just going to scream at you instead, okay, or I'll get somebody else to, you know, to take you to court or something like that, okay. So that's the, that's the overall idea that violence is not a result of failing to understand that the people you're hurting are humans. It's not the result of the failure of morality, right? And, and because morality is not just about avoiding harm. In fact, it's got very little directly to do with avoiding harm, except that you should avoid harm to people who are in communal relationships with you and thus they pollute that relationship and that sort of thing. Um, that, that morality, moral motives, are motives to regulate, to create, to sustain, to repair, to redress, to enhance, to properly terminate, and to mourn relationships. Um, and those motives very often push people to violence. Now, people have many motives, and violence is a rare thing to do, even in the most violent societies. And so often those other motives over, you know, overcome, overwhelm the, the motives, you know, the sense that you ought to hurt somebody, but there are a lot of other countervailing motives, and you don't do it. And sometimes you feel really bad that you didn't do it. So in Tom Sawyer, Okay, uh, the widow Douglas feels real bad that she's not, you know, beating Tom enough. <laughs> she feels, you know, she's very apologetic because she feels like she should beat him more, but she just can't bring herself to do it. So she feels guilty for not beating him. Okay, because she feels like if she'd been a good moral person, she would have just beat beat Tom some more. Okay, so people can have complex uh, sets of motives that lead them toward or away from violence, um, and they may feel different <laughs> things at different times. But when they're violent. Most of the time, the violence is intended, the purpose of it, the reason, the feeling, the sentiment involved is because people feel they should do it, and they must do it, and it's the right thing to do.
Now, um, have you done research into people who commit violence against animals? Is, is that ever, is that usually morally motivated or? Well, people, um, there's actually some interesting books about medieval trials that were held for, for animals were put on trial and, and, and convicted <laughs> and subject to capital punishment. And, you know, people kick their dogs if they, if they think the dog has done something outrageously moral and so forth and so on. But for the most part, when people uh, people hurt animals to eat them or to make them pull the plow in the right direction and so these are mostly not moral acts. When people kill and injure, you know, the, the, the researcher who sacrifices is the word they use, sacrifices the animals, it not, doesn't think of this as a moral, he just thinks this is, you know, it's like cutting up wood or something, it's just something you do. So most, most vi violence, most you know, hurting and killing animals is not moral, but some of it is. Sometimes if you think the horses, you know, ran off with your daughter on, you know, on her back and he sh should know better and, you know, people can wh whip and beat the, the horse or something as a punishment, right? And people punish their dogs and punish their cats sometimes. It's useless to punish your cat. But, um, you know, and, and people have shock collars and things like that. So sometimes it's morally motivated, but not, not generally. I mean, you can look at it, you can pretty clearly see. But if, if, if uh, human sacrifice is often morally motivated, then animal sacrifice probably oh. is too. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, no, no. When, when, when Mosi kill a goat or the Greeks, you know, uh, kill, immolated a goat or something, yeah, that was moral for sure. And it, is there any evidence, I mean, animals perpetrate violence against other animals, against people. Is there any evidence that violence done to species is motivated by relational models? Well, there is some really interesting data from vervet monkeys uh, and uh, a number of other mammal species, and even from European rooks, which are corvids, like crows and so ravens. So suppose, and corvids have friendships as well as kinship relationships, but supposing that you and Vivian are friends, okay? And John and I are friends. And suppose you, uh, take his food or attack him at one point. If you follow the, the, the birds over the next hour or two, I'm pretty likely to attack you because I'm John's friend. But I'm also pretty likely to attack Vivian because she's the friend of the person who hurt my friend. Now, is that moral? Well, it's something pretty interesting that I would, that I would go after Vivian because she's the friend of the person who hurt my friend. <laughs> So that's a little bit, that's a lot like not only third party, but fourth party punishment, right? Um, and, and that's been demonstrated quite well in, in not only mammals, but at least one bird species. Um, and the you know, vervet monkeys do the same indirect, thing and so forth. Indirect ways. So yeah. So that, that's it's like communal sharing. Yeah, well it's like feuding, where you got one of ours, we're gonna get one of yours. If not the one who, you know, doesn't have to be the killer, we'll get somebody else in your group, you know? Animals, so we kill animals that belong to someone else. So, yeah. so to punish people and and certainly, burn. certainly, uh, you find.
find retaliation, direct retaliation. Um, you know, Vivian was telling me about some studies where if, if, if I come to your aid when you're uh, <coughs> trying to hurt her, right, then uh, you might attack me later, right? But also your allies might attack me. And that is found in chimpanzees. I don't know. I'm going to put the. So this phenomenon is, is found in chimpanzees, and Franz de Waal calls it the a re revenge system. Uh, I don't know whether other primates have exactly the same. But but and, and on the positive side, if you've been grooming me a lot, okay, and she attacks you, I'm more likely to support, I'm more likely to attack you. So my violence is, you know, it's like we, it's like a treaty, okay? Well, you've attacked my ally, so I'm bound to her because she's been grooming me, and so I'm on her side now, and so I'm going to join her in driving you off. Okay, and that's very common in many primates, that grooming is... If you groom an animal, they're much more likely to support you in agonistic encounters. Yeah. Um, and and there, is, there, there are other kinds of third-party interventions. So you find that a, a zebra stallion will interfere with the mares fighting in, in, in the mares that he's guarding and so forth. And, one, and elephants, other animals. There are a number of animals where, the, where one animal, where the, and, and a, a, a gorilla male in, in the small troop of animals, you know, the small band of gorillas will, will interfere with others fighting and take the side, <coughs> the side of the, usually the, the smaller, younger one. So that's very common and that's, you know, you can, it's sort of like third party punishment or thir third party mediation. Yeah. I would like to return to John's question because I think we, we include uh, other species in our uh, communal relations. Yeah. We include dogs, we include yeah. horses, so, and yeah. they include us yeah. in their relations. Oh, my so dog, the first thing, they, the thing most likely to make my dogs never hurt anybody, but if they were to hurt anybody, I think they would do it if, I, if they thought, well, I've seen them go, Rah! you know, and people that they thought were a threat to me. Yeah, yes. yeah sure. They see me as part of the pack. I look like a dog, you know. And I bark. But no, that's that's for sure. But you wouldn't call this moral. Well, you can call it. You can say it's the regulation of relationships. Mm -hmm. so be, that, if so, if that's what you mean, then the animals do intend to regulate their relationships. So, if somebody breaks into my house and I thought they would injure my family, I would defend. I mean, I am a pacifist, but push comes to shove, I would try to do something other than violence. But if I had to use violence to protect my children, I would do so. And the dogs feel the same way. The dogs would protect my children or me. You know, they're not pacifists, but they would. But uh, <laughs> well, they're pretty gentle. But but yeah. So it's it's pretty similar, I think. And of course, you know, innumerable stuff. birds and mammals will yeah. protect their uh, protect their own offspring against not only predators but other animals of the same species. So. A male lion who comes into a new, who drives off the, the existing, the, the male lion who's there in, with a pride, will try to kill the babies of the female, so bring them, so they'll start ovulating, and he can have more offspring. But of course, the females, the moms, try to protect their babies, and that's one of the reasons that females probably establish alliances in both both lions and primates and so forth, because uh, primates do the same thing. So one of the re an alliance of females can protect their babies better than a, than, a, than a solitary female, and they do. They'll you know many females will die protecting their offspring. Mm -hmm. So that's something like what we're talking about. You know. And of course, people you know, if you try to st if I'm a Greek shepherd and you try to steal my sheep, I'm go after you. Yeah, so people people view their livestock as you know. In the, in the American West, they used to hang people who, for stealing horses and cattle. So I, I would like I would like to ask about uh, good uh, good and wrong, good right and, and right. bad, uh, right and wrong, uh, or good and bad uh, behavior. 
So we are not allowed to behave uh, just because we, we want to or we, our emotions tell us to do something or retaliate or revenge something. Uh, some. So moral in a cultural sense is more than that. So we call right and wrong something else, it, it, it seems, it seems, than just behave uh, to, to balance or to, to get a kind of um, equilibrium. Well, I, guess what I'm, I think you need to distinguish between descriptive morality and prescriptive morality. So I'm trying to describe the motives of the perpetrators. Now, the fact that you're morally motivated to hurt her doesn't mean that I think you should... I, I can understand totally that your motives are moral and still feel that you're violating my morals and stop you, right? And, the, and the, even though in your community, among your friends and your family, everybody would agree that you ought to beat her up for... for flirting with somebody else, right? I don't agree with that. The law doesn't agree with that. And the moral philosophers don't agree with that, right? We're all going to try to stop you. But that doesn't mean that you're not genuinely morally motivated because you're operating in a different moral system than, you know, than McIntyre or Plato or, you know, or Rawls or <laughs> whatever, and different than my moral system, right? So we have to distinguish between what we, uh, as ethicists judge about somebody's behavior, and they're what they're judging, okay? So if we're trying to understand your behavior, if you see violence, the odds are very good that the person doing the violence thinks, that not only thinks they're doing the right thing, but are doing the violence because they feel it's right, okay? That doesn't mean you are, I mean, you know, I think that essentially all violence is wrong. So every time I read about somebody who's morally motivated, I say, okay, I understand you're morally motivated, I would like to stop you. I think what they're doing is wrong. But, you know, to, to get them to stop, the best way to do it is to figure out why they're doing it. And they're usually doing it because they feel they have to. They feel they should. Okay? That doesn't mean that, the, that most moral philosophers would agree with them, although many moral philosophers at many points in history have believed in just war and believed that you should, of course, spank your children. How are you going to, if you don't beat your children, how are they going to be God-fearing, you know? Uh, used to be taken for granted. And many people have believed, you know, many fine moral philosophers, I'm sure, beat their wives because people used to, in many cultures, beat their wives. And everybody thought, well, of course, you have to. You know, how are you going to step, maintain your authority? Right? So the fact that the person is motivated morally in, in, in a subjective sense that they genuinely believe, they, that this is what they not only believe but feel, that those are their motives, doesn't mean that we have to sit back and say, oh, well, they're morally motivated, so it's fine. You know, we're all relativists. <coughs> no, I, you know, I want to stop all these people from doing all this stuff. Because <coughs> I think it's all wrong. So how do we do that? We have to persuade them that it's wrong. And Now, how do we persuade people that it's wrong? Well, sometimes people will listen to moral leaders whom they identify with, people who are like them, but have but uh, and live in the same circumstance or religious leaders or people of high prestige who used to do what they did but now don't do it anymore. Um, sometimes they think that their peers and their families in the community approve of this when they're wrong. And then, of course, it's relatively simple because you've just got to show them that, they're, that, they're, that they're, everybody else doesn't think this is right. And then how do you make more, bring about moral change in general? I think you get people to have more perspective and uh, somehow be more compassionate. But I don't know exactly. I think there are two sides here. So one is to convince people that this is wrong, and another one is to give them better means yes to regulate right. social relations. Right, so they're going to have to regulate their relationships. What can they do instead of violence? So you yeah. give them alternatives. Exactly. 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 So you say, well, here's a mediator who will work this out with you. Or here's a way of talking it out in front of, you know, in a public forum or with a, the with a, a, a rabbi or, you know, the imam or something and with a moral authority or let's bring your parents in here or whatever. Um, yeah, so you, you need to give them alternatives. 
Um, and there are alternatives. There are, I mean, in every society there are nearly always alternatives. So even in a feuding society that's based on an eye for an eye, there's usually something that can be done, and sometimes it isn't usually done until the second or third stage, but it, but it can be done in the first stage, which is you pay, the, the, the killers pay compensation. Or sometimes they give a bribe to the people, so they replace a person with a person. And that's, you know, in every society that does eye for an eye feuding, that's an alternative. So you say, well, let's try that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think you're right. Because you can't just leave them without any way of regulating the relationship. Yeah. And and violence is never the 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 most common way of re regulating. I mean, there's no relationship except contests of violence themselves, except football and boxing, where violence is the primary, typical way of regulating a relationship. In all others, it's rare, right? And people only do it in fairly extreme circumstances. And so, one thing you want to do is cut it off before that. You know, somehow try to address the problem before people feel like this is the only alternative. But in other, you know, as long as you have contests of violence, as long as people think it's football is good and jousting and chivalry is good, then of course you're saying, well, fine, you get more status by being more violent. And you know, in, in many pastoral societies, many herding societies, that's the way people think. The no, the you know, the the, the, admir ad, the admirable man is somebody who's fearless and good at killing people. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe what we do sometimes is to give society an option so that we don't feel pain. So we can give reasons to other people uh, how to organize themselves and how to organize a community so that we are included and that we don't suffer so much. So maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe this uh, is a kind of self-organization, but that in each one can give reasons to others uh, so that um, he, he will be included or he, she will be included in a way that she she isn't punished or she won't suffer so much and so on. And I see it like that in many groups, family groups and I don't know, academic groups. I think uh, people self-organize themselves and they do that giving reasons and acting according to some reasons so that uh, the the group can work or can function, and uh, the, the individuals uh, don't suffer so much. I don't know. I, I don't work with that kind of uh, theory, but as I see, there is uh, we 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 avoid pain. So, in some sense, also from a moral uh, point of view, um, we. We use uh, organization to avoid pain, yes, and although, although and are these good. are, as you as you said, uh, these are extreme behaviors, as I see it, where pain is there, but where you can't avoid anymore. Well, In people the sometimes seek pain. You have to remember the you have to remember the. American Indian Vision Quest, the football, um, and in and there have been periods in European history when suffering and pain were uh, considered uh, morally uh, valuable. That the more pain and you suffered, uh, the more you understood the nature of purgatory and hell, the more you were prepared to meet God, and the more virtuous you were for uh, uh, putting up with it gracefully. And people sometimes inflicted pain on themselves, or sometimes they simply accepted the, the many pains that people had with, without modern medicine and so forth. Um, and there are a number of societies. Uh, in Yap, for example, is a nice ethnography of this in, 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 in the Pacific island of Yap, uh, where suffering pain is thought to be very virtuous and to purify. Or to, in Yap especially, the notion is 
And unless you suffer a good deal of pain, how can you feel compassionate for other people suffering pain? So the person who suffered a good deal is likely to be the most compassionate, and also the notion of suffering for others. Oh, my back is hurting because I've been working so hard on the farm feeding my family, and that the pain you're suffering is a sign that, of, of your devotion to your family. So pain isn't, I mean, pain so isn't always avoided. Degree, People yeah. seek out pain sometimes. If you look at, uh, you know, uh, marathon runners and, su and ultra marathon runners, they're seeking a certain kind of pain. Um, so it, it isn't just as simple as people seek pleasure and avoid pain. They often see moral virtue in pain. And you know, the flagellants, we saw them the, in Muharram, they're trying to hurt themselves. And they it bring, it cre because the relationship they're creating or enhancing is more important than is, is, is you know, pain is a means to something that's really much more important to them than, than avoidance of pain. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Any more comments, questions? I have one. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to do that, but my English is not so good. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question about the motivational factor of the morality. Let's see, uh, what's the effect of a history of punishment on my violent behavior? Let's suppose that I'm using violence to protect someone I love or someone I care, but every time I use violence, I got punished. I lose a battle or something like that. Are you trying to use violence after that? What's the chances? Well, people will use violence if they think it's morally obligatory, even if it's, you know, even if it might lead, sometimes people will use violence even though they know it's going to lead to their own deaths. Um, <clears throat> so violence as punishment can, only, can teach you different things. It can teach you that, well, if you're in the right, you should use violence to, you know, to regulate the relationship. So if, you know, generations of children who are beaten by their parents think that it's fine to beat your your children because that's what loving parents do, right? And so okay. you, of course, may treat your children the same way, or they may generalize beyond that and say, well, <clears throat> when people do something wrong, they insult you or they fail in their duty, that you should hurt them. Okay. So violent punishment doesn't necessarily create deterrence. For some kinds of violence, it's a, it's a model for how to behave. Um, I was thinking that I can, uh, I can think that my violence is right. I, I, I'm doing that because it's right. I'm defending someone I love. But if the environment gives uh, an answer, a punishment answer, I will stop to do that. Well, not necessarily. So what is motivation? So if I genuinely feel that the, it's morally... I might stand up to protect my daughter's honor, even though I'm going to die in the process. I mean, look at the Iliad. It's full of people dying, knowing that they were going to death to, you know, to defend their honor or their, their family's honor. I mean, as many people will die to, you know, to protect their honor. Uh, now, some people won't. It depends on how important the moral issues are to you. Depends on how important it is. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and whether and how important life is. I mean, whether life is more or less important than the family honor or your honor. So for some people, their own honor is worth much, is much more important than their life. They'd rather die and have people say, there was a man of honor, than live and have people say, ugh, he's dirt, you know, he's a coward. Yeah. Let's see. Thanks. Thank you, Bart. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. According to your research, are we getting better or worse? Well, not my research, uh, better or worse, of course. From my ethical point of view or descriptive point of view? <laughs> From your point of view. Well, Steven Pinker has written yep. a wonderful book <clears throat> with very powerful evidence, I think, uh, that is, I find very persuasive, it's called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he has uh, shown that at, at every time scale that you look at, whether you look at compare, uh, you look at the last few thousand years, or you look at the last 300 years, or you look at the last 50 years, or even the last five or 10 years, 
uh, nearly all kinds of violence have dramatically declined, not by 10 or 20 percent, but by 10 or 100 fold. Okay, the, the, the nearly, well, essentially every kind of violence, whether it's violence perpetrated by the state, in the, in the regulation of law, or whether it's uh, violence within the family, or you know, punishment of children, or whether it's sports that are, you know, what sports, and uh, whether it's combat in war, or, you know, you, he's looked at essentially every kind of violence, and they've all declined. Now, it's a bouncy thing. In World War II, there was a huge amount of violence and so forth. But uh, on the whole, you know, if we don't blow ourselves off the face of the earth with nuclear weapons, uh, it's remarkable. And what's interesting is that the, the, the decline occurs on all these time scales. And then, you know, so he devotes 500 pages to documenting this and 200 pages to trying to figure out why. I think he's less successful at figuring out why, but he's got some really interesting theories that range all over the place from just, you know, one of the little theories is the more people are illiterate, the more people understand other people's perspectives in general, not only specific <coughs> other perspectives, and the more they see that other people suffer like them, and you know, he tries, he goes all over the place looking for reasons. Um, but uh, and he wrote the the preface to our book, so we're very pleased to have it. There's a, there's a book on this called Virtuous mm -hmm. Violence by Fisk and Rye, Cambridge University Press, available in both digital and paper versions. And there's a lot more detail on that, and a lot more theoretical depth, if I can say so. Now, what this suggests is that if you see violence, you should go look for the moral motives of the perpetrators. Now, maybe, we're not saying that every time you'll find that, but that's the most likely, that's the starting point. And if you want to reduce violence, you should look at why people feel they should do it, and then address that. And as, as Vivian says, give them some other nonviolent way to do it, and, 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 and change the culture so the nonviolent way is, the, is what's considered to be the right way, and the violent way is considered to be wrong. And then, you know, if, if our theory is anywhere near right, the violence should precipitously drop. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Now I see it. So you don't have it. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I, I thought I had seen it.